Good morning, congregation. I hope all of us had a wonderful week last week. Uh, Thanksgiving. Hopefully everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. You know, Jesus means the world to me. I hope he means the world to all of us and that we will do all we can to work in his kingdom until that final day. You know, when I decide, when I decide to put a lesson together, it never seems to remain on that subject that I pick. So I'm going through, okay, Lord, this one, okay, Lord, this one, no. I want you to speak about this. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 11, verses 9 and 10. That's going to be a tough one. You see, but we live in a time where we need to reach the youth. We need to reach the youth every time we look up and see on the news. We see a lot of violence, a lot of young people doing evil, those who are without the knowledge and the understanding of our creator. Today's lesson topic is vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The word vanity has the thought of something that appears for a moment, then vanish away, like smoke or your breath. Even the breath of life is vanity. So when we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting with verse 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, David reigned from around 970, I do believe, to about 930 or 31, somewhere up in there, about 40 years. So did I say David? I mean Solomon. Solomon reigned. Uh, and he says in verse 2, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. There is going to come a time where we're going to have to say goodbye to this world. And when that time come, will you have done enough to earn that position in heaven? We understand that we can't earn anything far as what God has placed for grace and all of that, but you must work out your own salvation. So if you're not working at that, then you're not going to be where the Bible speaks concerning uh, happiness and blessedness and, and joy everlasting. So we have in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, you see light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Now, Solomon approaches those of age so that they may understand that light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun because it's going to come a time where you're not going to see that sun anymore. 
Verse 8, so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. You see, light was the first thing that God created. See, and it is the first thing that our eyes see when we open them as babies. We see light, yet the light that we see may be imitation light compared to the glorious light of the Lord. You see, darkness has to deal with death and sin. So he speaks to the aged. You are going to die, but you must remember, rejoice in all things. You see in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart. And put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life are vanities. Is a vanity. So rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 7. Concerning the children of Israel, and there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household, in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. The Lord always want us to eat and rejoice. As you look throughout the scriptures, he's going to tell you to eat and rejoice. That's what he does. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 11, concerning the Feast of Weeks. He says, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levites who is within your towns, the sojourners, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You see, I don't follow fashion, and I'm no yes man. I believe that what Christ has done is for all eternity. He purchased the church with his own blood. You have people that get baptized into the body of Christ, and then they look at the numbers and say, this isn't the one, and they decide that they want to go and be a part of something with great numbers. You see, that is not the way that salvation works. Many are called, but few are chosen. You see, the young man applies himself, you see, as children to awaken them to think of death. This is what Solomon does with the aged. He strives to awaken them in seven and eight that the time is coming. And it is ironical how that Solomon puts it with rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Some may uh, make this to be the counsel which atheists and Epicure give to the young man, says the poisonous suggestions against which Solomon in the close of the verse prescribes a powerful antidote. The end of verse nine, but it is more emphatic if we take it at it is commonly understood by the way of irony, like the prophet Elijah, when he was dealing with the false prophets, and the bells, and he tells them, go ahead and call on your God. If he is a God, he will answer you. And as Micaiah dealt with Ahab, and he 
prophet concerning his prosperity, it was in an ironical way. And just as Christ said to his disciples, sleep on. The irony of that. The advice may be considered as serious when he says to the young man concerning the joy, see, that as mirth and cheerfulness or uh, for us of uh, the creature of God with moderation and temperance is allowable to all men in common. We must look at things in a moderate from a frame of mind, and it is spoken of throughout this book of moderation, as is commendable and is healthful and profitable to man. So it is particularly youthful, it's good for the youthful and the aged, whose natural desires may be to enjoy their outward senses and to be gratified by the things that they do. It is a beautiful thing when you have the strength to be able to jump an eight foot, 10 foot fence. That's youth right there. I seen a little kid over in front of my house playing the other day, the ball went into the neighbor's yard, the neighbors got dogs. We stand in there. We say, hey, don't jump in that yard. They got dogs over there. Next, the guy only this tall. The fence higher than my armor. Up. He jumped up that fence, jumped down into that yard, grabbed that ball, threw it back over, jumped back over. I said, my, my, my. I remember those days. You see, that's, that's, that's youthfulness. You see, but to have our senses and gratifications, that's part of life, but it must be used in a lawful way. You see, a lot of times we want to give our best to the devil, to the world. When we're young, we want to give it all to the world. And we give no thought for the Lord and giving the Lord our best when we are young and growing up. You see, that is where it's at. You see, so for the young, for as is consistent with the fear of God and the expectations of a future judgment, you must be conscious of this, young people. You must be conscious of this, aged, or it may be considered with respect to religious and spiritual exercises when it comes to you exercising the ability to judge between good and evil. We must understand as young men and women, we should remember our creator in the days of our youth as it follows, as they should rejoice in God, their maker, as Ecclesiastes has told us. And when we look in uh, Psalms chapter, uh, chapter 149 and 2, let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let us rejoice in the king, not in the things of the world. We must be able to make a distinguishment. You should not rejoice in evil. You should not rejoice in evil, to which human nature is inclined, especially in youth, you see. But our focus should be in good, doing good. We should rejoice not in the ways of sin, but in the ways of wisdom, not in any outward attainment of beauty, because that beauty will end up in the fire apart from Christ. We should not glory in wit and strength 
or riches, but in the grace of God, not in ourselves or our boasting of what we have accomplished in life because it will be tested by the fire of our God, but our boasting should be in Christ. Our boasting should be in his person, in righteousness, in salvation, not in the things of time and sense. Thank God that you are able to walk this morning. I went to a convalescent home. Give me. And there. I visited a friend of mine who could not no longer move. So be thankful for movement, for vision, to be able to do the things you do today. Use them for the kingdom of God. See, but in the hope of the glory God, that is where we should be dwelling, as in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 13, dealing with a youthful fellow. In chapter 15, starting with verse 11, and the son said, and he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me, and he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. Give me all that is mine so I can go and waste it. Young people, we should not have that thought you are children of God. Don't waste your life. That word far country means that you have gone away from the presence of the Lord. We don't want to go far. We want to stay near. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. From the age of 13 to 20, let your heart do you good. Let your heart be good in you thought of the heart be employed about that which is good. We want that which is good employed in our hearts. I heard a young lady say the other day, yesterday, I'm in the store pumping my gas. I mean, I'm in the store paying for my gas so I can go and pump it. And the two workers in the store, you see, I told you, I told you you shouldn't have hired him. You shouldn't have hired him. He, I, I said, what's going on? She said, oh, we hired some guy, and uh, he has sticky fingers. So <laughs> I said, OK. So I thought about my lesson. I said, yeah, we, we have to be careful with what we employ. We have to look over it and reason. Is this evil? We don't want this to be in our life. Moderation with, with everything, you see. The thought of the heart being employed about with that which is good, spiritual, heavenly, and divine, the affections of your heart set thereon. We must be looking at things above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, you see. And the will and desire of your heart be drawn out after such things. You know that if you have friends that's doing something that's not right, as in Proverbs chapter 1, where the youth were talking about putting everything in one purse and going out and robbing and stealing and killing for whatever they want to get. That's what we have today. You see, let your heart be prompt and put you on doing that which is good with the light in mind. You don't want to go on the side of darkness, as in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth 
before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasures in them. And in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 27, it is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Be youthful for God, for good things, not for the world in darkness, you see. And then he walks in the ways of his heart. It is never good to walk in the way of your heart. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is the way that leads to death. You have so many children, youthful individuals that is on the path to destruction, you see. As Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29, See, this alone I found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. We must not be a schemer. We must follow the works of the creator, you see, being created a clean one. As in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, he makes all things new. We must be sprinkled, purged, and purified by the blood of Christ, in which the fear of God is put. The laws of God are written where Christ is formed in our hearts by the Spirit. See, in his words, dwells richly in us. And he himself, by faith, where the Spirit of God and his grace are there we need to be as members of the body of Christ and then to walk in the way of such a heart is to walk in the fear of God that's where our walk is we must pay attention to the instructions that the scriptures give us as according to his word Christ is our example and to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. We must learn that as in Job 31 and seven, if my steps has turned aside from the way and my heart has gone after my eyes and if any spot has stuck to my hands, don't let your eyes lead you astray because it is only with the eyes that we are led astray. See in Psalms 81, 11 through 13, but my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn hearts to follow their own counsel. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my way. All things that were written before time were written for our learning. We must learn not to make mistakes as those did before us. We are the body of believers of the new covenant. We have so much. They look forward to seeing this. They did not see this. But we are a part of this. Christ said that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. How about that? Think about that one. And in Jeremiah 7, 23 and 24, but this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. It is not good to walk in your own heart, as Solomon told the young man with irony, you see. So we see that in Acts chapter 14 and verse 16, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, but has now called all men to repent and be converted for the times of refreshing is coming from the presence 
of the Lord. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin, and which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now, that, that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We don't want to be like the rest of mankind. And in the sight of thine eyes, we'll be closing up here. As enlightened by the Spirit of God, directing and guiding in the way in which a man should walk, looking unto Jesus in all the while he is walking or running his Christian race. This should be our focus and walking in him as he has received us, young men, young women, aged, pressing toward him, the mark for the prize of the high calling. There are those who will tell young men to indulge themselves in carnal mirth, to take their swing of simple pleasures, and to gratify their our senses in carnal lust to the uttermost. It's okay, daughter, go ahead, go and enjoy your life. You're giving them the ticket to go and kill themselves. It's what you're doing, you see. Even the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, which young men are most addicted to. You ever want to know if you are addicted to something? Just pick one thing out in your life that you do over and over again. Is it good or is it bad? You see, because the young are addicted to a certain lifestyle. It says, do all this as if it was said and see what would be the issue of it. Or do all of this if you can. You want to watch yourself, watch the people you hang around with. But there's one thing you must bore in mind, that God will bring you into judgment. He will bring you into judgment, as in Ecclesiastes 2 and 10. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, this was my reward for all my toil. Solomon, at the age in which he wrote this, had lived already. So he can write about life experiences. See, if you, if you are 17, 18, 22, 24, see, I lived that already, so I can talk about it. But if you're not over 50, then, hey, the same goes for someone who's older than me. That's 70. Same thing. I've lived longer than you. I, I used to be your age, so you need to listen to me. You ain't never been 70. And that's the problem that we're having today. People are refusing to listen. As God told Eve and Adam in the garden, do not touch a certain tree. Yet the tree was good to the eyes, pleasant, and all of this. They did it anyway, you see. So we look at all the greatness of Solomon in chapter 7, no, in Joshua. So there was an individual who coveted after things, and it cost him, cost him very much in Joshua chapter 7 and verse 21 because he went after his heart. So what we say is, according to 1 John chapter 2 and 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with his lust desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. 
this is how we abide forever, is by knowing the will of God. So, in my final thoughts, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. You see, it's not a temporal judgment, but it is eternal. Not in this present life, but in the one to come. The judgment that will be after death, the last and awful judgment in which is certain and may be known. So we say in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17, moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and every work going to come into judgment. And final, Ecclesiastes 12 and 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, rather good or bad. So today, let us use our youthfulness and our agedness for the purpose of the furtherance of the kingdom of heaven, which we are a part of right now. If you stand in need of prayer, we will pray over you. If you are a Christian, not a Christian here this morning, we have the ability to offer that opportunity to you by baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank the congregation here for giving me an opportunity to speak once again.